can do it. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of the uh, conditions that uh, scleral lenses are designed to address. Uh, but I'm going to talk, let's start with the first. So, so millions of people throughout the world suffer from uh, devastating corneal conditions and scleral lenses have the potential to change the lives of so many patients. And um, here, this is a picture of, uh, very few people have seen this, but this is the a photograph of the very first refractive surgery ever done. It was done in Bogota, Colombia by a Dr. Barraguer back, started in, in the late 1960s. This is keratomalesis where the doctor removed the cornea, froze it, put it on a lathe and reshaped the cornea. And then this particular patient, many years later, had RK surgeries. You can see the RK cuts over the, the cornea that was treated by this frozen section and relayed. And uh, why do we use scleral lenses? Because it's so unique in improving vision, protecting the compromised cornea, and also allows the cornea uh, to heal. So, these are some of the conditions that we used uh, scleral lenses for. Keratoconus, refractive surgery complications, chronic dry eye, corneal neuropathy, corneal ectasia, injuries from burns and chemical injuries, eyelid abnormalities, transplant complications, corneal dystrophy such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome and very high refractive errors. So we, we designed these lenses to fit, vault over the cornea and to rest on the sclera. So considerations uh, in designing a scleral lens. We're interested in the overall scleral lens diameter, making sure we have proper corneal and limbal clearance, making sure the landing zone is aligned with the conj, conjunctiva and sclera the scleral lens edge design, and the asymmetric back surface design. And the scleral lens diameter is, is determined by the shape and the contour of the cornea. Now, a larger diameter scleral lens will be needed when we need more clearances required. And if you need a larger optical zone diameter, you're going to need a larger scleral lens diameter also. So we measure corneal clearance in microns. We typically want between 150 and 300 microns of clearance. When managing ocular surface disease, the clearance may need to be increased more than normal. After several hours of wear, the clearance of a, between the back of the lens and the front of the cornea can drop or sink 100 microns or more. And for this reason, when we dispense a scleral lens for the first time, it's important to have the patient return after several hours to see how much that lens has settled. We're talking about landing zones, so this is a bad landing zone. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything, one second. Okay. Nothing's, okay. This, is, this would be considered a good landing zone, where the long, thin, and matches the shape of the sclera, 360 around the clock. These are some of the various corneal shapes that we can work with. Um, the top left, that's just an eye that had the Ferrero rings. This is not in Texas, this is done in South America. That's a scleral lens going over that cornea. The next one on the top right, it looks like a pellucid cornea, but it actually is post laser corneal lactasia. And here we have a, a scleral lens design that folds over that. Uh, and the bottom left is a post arcade cornea. You can see the, uh, the big cut, uh, right? Uh, yeah, you can see that big cut. And uh, <clears throat> on the bottom right is a nipple cone, very pronounced, steep cornea. Let's move on. And this is what we're trying to avoid. This particular patient uh, underwent a corneal transplant. The first cornea uh, had to be replaced after a week. The second cornea 
The eye developed an infection. Uh, the eye developed an enophthalmitis. The interior chamber collapsed. And from the top left photo to the bottom right was a, a time of period of about 50 or 16 months. And you can see the sequence of events, what happened. Um, the first photograph, top left, was taken about five or six days after the transplant. The top right was taken several months later. The bottom left was taken a few months after that. You see there's no pupil. And the bottom right, it's a dead eye altogether. There's nothing there. So, and this can happen. These are rare events, but, but they happen. So our goal is to fit a scleral lens on a compromised cornea to avoid the patient needing a corneal transplant. This is a patient that had a, um, uh, a, cor uh, a neuropathy, acoustic neuropathy, was unable to close the eye. When we first saw this patient, the left photo is on the first day that visited us. Visual acuity is basically hand motion. We had the patient, we designed the scleral lens for the patient to wear 24 hours. So um, the picture on the right was taken around seven or eight months later. Visual acuity with the eye after seven or eight months was around 2025. But this is after wearing the scleral lens almost continuously for about seven or eight months. And you can see the healing effect, the therapeutic effect of a well-designed scleral lens. Here's another patient who lost his upper left eyelid in a car accident. Uh, the, eye, the lid was severed. Um, if, I found this out late, uh, later, but I was told that if we were, were unable to fit this patient with a scleral lens, they were going to remove his eye. But um, we fit the eye with a scleral lens. He was also, we kept the lens on almost 24 7. For three months, I saw this patient every day. And I mean every day. And here, three months later, the, the eye is a lot clearer, it's still compromised. But the patient vis visit visited us from uh, a, a Middle Eastern country. And he had to go back and he got continuing care when he returned home. And these are some of the keratokinic corneas that we work with. On the left is a nipple cone, on the right is a, uh, a global cone. Again, here is a very, very thin nipple cone with a scleral lens over that. This is pretty rare. This is a superior pellucid marginal degeneration. When this patient came to see us, his visual acuity was less than 21,000. Uh, we fit him with a scleral lens and his visual, we got it to 2025. But you see how pronounced the superior aspect of that cornea is. And you can see the matching topography. This patient was a cab, is a cab driver uh, in another country. And I, I asked him, how could he drive a cab? And he told me, uh, he had the roads memorized, but um, let's move on. Uh, the photo on the left, and you can see uh, high drops there, but this is actually post LASIK corneal ectasia on the left. It's not, it's, you can call it PMD, but it's a post LASIK corneal ectasia. On the right, you can see the uh, high drops on a global cone. We fit both of these eyes with scleral lenses. And this, again, acute onset of high drops. Uh, we treated this eye medically for about two or three weeks, very aggressively with various uh, eye drops, including Timolol, Mira 128, and Fred Forte. And this eye, after two or three weeks, cleared up 85% of that high drops, that, that haze was gone. So now we'll keep talk about asymmetric back surface designs. So more often than not, the sclera going around the clock is not symmetrical. There's, is a, there's asymmetry. You can fit one part of the, of the eye well, and the other uh, part, the lens may be lifting off or impinging on the conjunctiva. So uh, for these situations, uh, quadrant-specific scleral lens designs may better address these, these, these uh, uh, unusual asymmetric sclera. So, this is a, uh, a, a computer we use, an imaging computer called the SMAP. The, the, what's, uh, there are 
uh, several companies that are involved with this. The technology is referred to as profilimetry, where we're mapping out not just the cornea, but the profile around the cornea. And with this instrument, we take three images of each eye. The images are stitched together to get one whole image. And you can see the colors represent asymmetries going around the clock. These images are uploaded to a special lab and they have the software to design a lens where the lens, the, the landing zone, the peripheral portion of the lens matches exactly the contour of the sclera going around the clock. Another uh, technology that I really enjoy working with is called uh, uh, eye print or impression technology. Uh, this particular patient has a glaucoma shunt going from six o'clock toward the pupil. You can see on the bottom left, you can see an image of that, that glaucoma shunt. And um, we took an impression of this eye and we had a, an eye print pro scleral lens made where that shunt was taken into consideration. You can see the bottom right, the outline of the eye print pro scleral lens that's designed to vault over that shunt. And the patient was quite comfortable with this particular design. Here's another uh, patient we, with, a, with a glaucoma shunt. This time the shunt was around 11 o'clock and you can see the outline of the shunt, but look at the eye print pro, the impression that we took. You can see the outline of the glaucoma shunt in the impression and the resultant eye print pro scleral lens vaults over this, this patient's eye. This is uh, the eye of an 11 year old girl who had uh, cataract surgery when, when she was less under three years old, gla glaucoma surgery and, and so forth uh, when she was just uh, under three or four years of age. And the patient's seen very well with this lens. Uh, here's another time we used uh, that technology. This, this eye underwent uh, five prior uh, corneal transplants, two shunts. You can see the arrows pointing to the shunts and to the huge blebs uh, on, on this eye. Now one problem that we all have to deal with or contend with on these uh, high knee patient populations are higher order aberrations where they're seeing halos and glare, starbursts, double vision, shadowing, and um, this is examples of some of the things that patients see. And there's emerging technology involving aberrimetry that are designed to take care of these. So this is a company uh, in this country called Ovitz, O-V-I-T-Z. I don't have it written down here, but the their website is ovitz, O-V-I-T-Z dot U-S. So for those watching, please write that down. It's a very interesting website where they talk about addressing higher order aberrations. Again, O-V-I-T-Z dot U-S. Um, so we take images of, uh, of, a, of a lens. We send the images uh, with the HOA readings to a, uh, a laboratory associated with University of Rochester, New York. They take that image, that information, send it to the lab. The lab, in this case, is iPrint, and they embed that into the optics of a scleral lens. So we call that kind of lens a wavefront design scleral lens. And this shows the uh, before and after uh, when we do the imaging before we have the uh, the Zernike images before we have the HOAs. Uh, technology embedded in the lens before and after. You can see the difference. Another way for patient education, uh, we'll, we'll use our, our topographer to do a point spread function to show how a point of light is dispersed on a keratoconic cornea, for example. And then when we put a scleral lens on, do the same topography, do the same uh, point spread function measurement again, and you can see the difference before and after. On the left, the image shows uh, the distortion of the uh, light as it enters the eye. And on the right, you can see a much better uh, imaging. That's why a scleral lens will take care of, uh, for the most part, higher order aberrations. RK surgery 
It was very popular from about 1985 to 1993. And then with the advent of LASIK surgery, uh, and very few people do that anymore. This is a, an eye print uh, lens over a post arcade cornea. You can see all the, all the cuts. This patient has no functional vision with his eye until we fit this eye with a, with a scleral lens. Here's an eye that underwent three RK surgeries over 30 years ago, three separate RK surgeries, followed by three separate LASIK surgeries many years later, followed by a corneal transplant surgery about eight months ago. You can see the cuts, you can see the outline of the LASIK flap. Here's another eye that underwent RK surgery followed by LASIK surgery many years later. I've never seen anyone who had multiple surgeries come out on top of this. Usually the, uh, the uh, what they call enhancements, make things worse. Here are multiple uh, corneas of uh, eyes that underwent uh, LASIK surgery after RK surgery. All of these people needed scleral lenses, all of them. So this is an eye of a five-year-old girl who was uh, working at an exercise machine while her mother was doing something else. She wasn't being monitored properly and something snapped and perforated the cornea. She had a retinal detachment. Um, of the lens, uh, she had a vitrectomy. The, uh, her, her own uh, uh, lens in her eye had to be removed. So this is an aphecic fake eye and we fit this eye with a, with a scleral lens. And so this is where trauma comes into effect, where a scleral lens can really help out a patient. Uh, here is another eye. Uh, this patient uh, was taking medication for restless leg syndrome. And uh, during cataract surgery, the patient's uh, body and leg sh shook violently. It took several technicians to hold them down all of this while the cataract surgeon was inside the eye. So you can see part of the iris is ripped away and you can see the uh, IOL there. And um, in any case, um, the patient's doing really well with this put a scleral lens. You can see the outline of the scleral lens and the top left, you can see the outline, top right also. These are three uh, three different eyes that uh, we worked on with a scleral lens. And again, uh, very often I've, I've noticed that when, when you're dealing with a, 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 a transplanted cornea, you're going to see a tilt. Look at the outline of the, the uh, OCT image below. Notice how there's a tilt there. And you fit this eye with a regular scleral lens, and maybe it touches one area or rubs against one part of the cornea and you have clearance in another part. Well, I don't want rubbing on a donor cornea because I, I don't want to take a chance on any rejection. On eyes like this, I tend to use um, either the uh, SMAP 3D computer to map out the, the lens, the uh, front of the eye, or we'll take an impression. In this case, we took an impression of the, this eye, and this is an iPrint Pro uh, scleral lens. So this. The back of this lens is designed to match perfectly every hill and valley of the front surface of that eye. So um, we don't have any rubbing taking place. It fits really nicely. This is a, a, an eye that uh, lost vision from shingles. Uh, a very distorted uh, cornea. And this, this is an 80 year old woman. This is her only eye. The other eye, she was born with a blind eye. She's terrified of having a corneal transplant. Uh, we fit the eye with a scleral lens. Um, the, this patient with the lens has around 20-80 vision, which is good enough for her. She lives alone, uh, lives by herself, and um, if she needed a transplant, there'd be nobody to take her to the doctor or to the hospital, so um, she's wearing this lens. She has an aid that helps her insert the lens and remove the lens. This is a photo of a, of a, uh, a transplanted cornea over an eye auto, autoimmune disease. This patient has lupus. And you can see the, uh, 
virtually no meibomian glands. Uh, at the iris, I'm pointing to a little bit of the pieces of the meibomian gland, upper lid and lower lid. And uh, we fit this eye with a scleral lens, and the patient has fairly good vision. Um, and this is the second transplant that this patient had to undergo. But the eye has been quiet for quite a while. If you look carefully, you can see some neovascularization going on to the donor cornea. That's not really a good sign. We don't want neovascularization on a donor cornea. So that's that on that. Uh, this is a, a patient, uh, this is a patient that had multiple blepharoplasties. He's a performer uh, and didn't want wrinkles under his eye. It turns out that uh, this, after multiple um, surgeries, eyelid surgeries, he can't close his eye. And we asked this patient, close your eyes as tight as you can. And that's it, what you're seeing over there. And uh, we fit this patient with two different scleral lenses, one pair of scleral lenses to wear when he sleeps, and another pair during the day. And when I first met this patient, he told me he had not slept in two years. So um, I see him regularly. He was just here the other day, and I was going to do a refill on one eye, and I said, you can't wear the lens for a couple of days. And he said to me, how, how am I going to sleep? So that's another issue. So... Uh, Stevens Johnson syndrome is a, a degeneration, very poorly understood. Apparently, it's a result of reaction to one's body to medication like uh, penicillin, um, uh, maybe some steroids, other medications. Um, and here you have a uh, top right a photograph of a uh, of a an eye with Stevens Johnson syndrome. That central area. This patient's from another country. That cornea perforated. Uh, the doctor uh, used crazy glue to seal up the perforation. The patient came to Miami to have medical treatment done. We fit that eye, that eye with a scleral lens to protect it. Anticipation for a surgical procedure that was be done here in Miami. Um, the bottom right uh, eye is also a Stevens Johnson. This is a very rare photo. It's virtually unheard of to see a corneal transplant on a Stevens Johnson eye, but this is the patient's only eye. The cornea perforated. The surgeon had no choice but to do a transplant. Miraculously, with the scleral lens, this patient has virtually 20-20 vision. But I took care of this patient for 10 years before this event took place, and he was seeing 20-30 with a scleral lens. Then the perf cornea perforated. And after the surgery, he's doing very well, almost 2020 with a scleral lens. This is a, a very rare condition known as Peter's anomaly. Um, the symptoms are there's a cataract, no iris, no pupil, a hazy, neovascularized cornea, sometimes scarring, uh, glaucoma. Uh, this patient uh, is a phacic, had, the, um, had her, lens, her own lens removed. There's no iris to hang on a, an IOL, so there's no intraocular lens in that eye. You can see all of the neurovascularization. There's no functional vision. Again, this is the patient's only eye. And um, to give her a pupil, we fit this eye with a blackened soft lens. We gave her a eight millimeter clear pupil and over that we put a scleral lens. So with the blackened pupil, with the, with the blackened soft lens and the scleral lens, the patient has 20-80 vision. Without this um, scleral lens, soft lens combo, the patient's visual acuity is basically hand motion. This is her only, life, uh, her only eye. She lives by herself also. Um, and she has a job now. She works in a nursing facility and empties out the trash and does menial work, but she has a job. This is a, again, a very, very rare condition known as gelatinous drop-like corneal dystrophy. It's genetic. 
There have only been a few cases like this documented in the world, mainly in Asia and principally in Japan. This patient is visited us from uh, the Middle East, um, and this also it's a young boy, 11 years old. This is after the second corneal transplant uh, with the scleral lens. The patient, again, without the lens, the patient's uh, visual acuity is, is less than 21,000. With the scleral lens and eyeglasses over, the patient's able to uh, identify around 2070 vision. And um, his corneal surgeon, that he's on a waiting list for another transplant uh, in about a year. So this is where uh, a scleral lens can actually change a life and, and save a life. And that's, I, I, I think I wound up early, uh, but that's my presentation. So I want to thank you all for listening to me. These are my websites, and that's my email address. Anyone, you're welcome to contact me, call me, whatever. So. Thank you, thank you indeed, uh, Dr. Andrew Boschlik. Uh, told, someone told me that it's your birthday. So. <laughs> birthday. I'm trying to ignore that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it, it, that was a very wonderful uh, uh, talk. Uh, very, it was just illustrative. I, I, I could say a word. Uh, I think that extreme cases to make a light. need extreme technologies. That's what I, I felt. I felt that uh, uh, you are using a lot of uh, means which uh, which are not uh, commonly used at the moment in uh, most of the countries, such as. Uh, such as the uh, ESMA, the ESMA 3D ocular surface profiler, the eye print for uh, impression, uh, impression, and uh, the office uh, HOA uh, uh, facilities, which could uh, which could uh, help uh, people see better. Well, uh, yeah, Pentacam is coming out with also profiling technology. Pentacam, and also there's a company that makes a, a, a profiler called the Eaglet, and I think that's a European company based in the Netherlands. So that can also be used. It's called the eaglet. I think it's being used in Europe. Yes, yes, yes it is. It is actually. Uh, I, I think that uh, we we have seen the the, 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 the good the good side of the sclerosis in some uh, disparate cases. But uh, I wonder if uh, uh, sclerosis. And also, uh, maybe if you uh, we have a lot of clearance, uh, uh, very um, depth, uh, deep clearance, uh, there are, is there a risk to have hypoxia? And also, I'm wondering about uh, this story of uh, pressure uh, intra uh, uh, IOP uh, increase with uh, uh, some sclerals which has been in the literature uh, for the few, few last years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there might have been some isolated cases where there was increased intraocular pressure after wearing scleral lenses. I have not seen that. We check everyone, their pressure uh, before, we do it uh, during their fitting period, and when they do come in for follow-up visits, we check everyone's pressure with several different pieces of equipment. So uh, I've never witnessed this. I think maybe that it was documented in one or two cases, and uh, a case presentation was do done in a journal. And next thing you know, the internet comes up with uh, various theories. I I don't think it's a th it's a real thing. I don't I don't I don't really don't think it's an issue. Now, as far as okay, extra yeah. clear, you, you mentioned about clearance, uh, which the sweet, yeah. yeah the sweet spot. To me, is you want to try and get around 200 microns of clearance. Sometimes you want 250 or 300. That's okay. You don't want to have like 500 microns of clearance. You're gonna have problems, and you and you really don't want under 100 microns. But we have OCT technology where we can. I use a, an instrument by Zeiss. It's called the Passante. Resolution of that instrument is seven microns. So we measure that carefully. Okay. Uh... Uh, the, uh, one of the, the, the first slide on the bad landing, bad landing and we go back landing. Can you get back to me? Yeah, can you get back to me now? One second. Bad landing? Yeah, let me go to, let me go to that. 
city got there. Yeah, you can see the edges digging into the into the square. Yes. One side, I can see one side. Yes. This wasn't my. This was not my lens. This is why a lens a patient came in with. So I'm innocent on that. Okay. It's dig. It's digging in, in inside the sclera. The it's in, it's into the conjunctiva. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, what what what's, what's the, the ideal uh, landing for you? Like that. Ideal. Okay. It's kind of tangent. Yeah, it's, tangent to the sclera. Yeah. You you want a tangent, and the longer the landing zone, as a rule, the better it is. It's like if a woman steps on your toe with a high heel shoe as opposed to a sneaker. You're distributing the weight of the lens over a wider area. It makes for a more comfortable fit. Personally, I found that uh, one of the difficult cases are uh, pellucid marginal degeneration because it's not uh, so obvious to, to get uh, the clearance uh, at the bottom of, uh, uh, of, the, of the edge at six mm -hmm. o'clock. Uh, 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 you are using some new technologies, but we are using most of the time uh, square lenses, which are not uh, which are not uh, uh, manufactured uh, so precisely. So, what's your advice? Uh, well, there's a there, I, well, I, if I was fitting a scleral lens, I want to vault over um, that part of the cornea, and sometimes you can only get by with maybe fifty or eighty microns of clearance. But you want to clear that area. After it settles down, try to have less, you know, 80 to 100 microns. And then some, you know, so it's at 12 o'clock in the upper portion, you may have three or 400 microns of clearance. Then below, you have 80 microns. You do this to, just do the best you can. But um, there's, a, there's a very fine laboratory in the Netherlands that can work with a lot of the doctors on that. I think it's Visser Lens. Have you heard of that company, Visser? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, but there are companies, there's technologies out there that can help you out with that. Nothing is perfect. You just try to manage it as best you can. Okay, uh, another question before I, 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 I try to get some questions from the audience. Uh, you, you're, uh, I, I have seen you, uh, most of your slides are, uh, I think, it's clear, full square lenses. It's a 16.5 or uh, larger than that. Yeah. Do you work with uh, semi-sclerals or not? You know, I don't use the word semi-scleral. It's either a scleral or it's not scleral. It's either a woman <laughs> is pregnant or she's not pregnant. So, <laughs> uh, 15, 15, uh, 14, 14 14.9. Well, those are small measure. lenses, but you're going to probably uh, hit the, the, the limbal area. So uh, my, the lenses I design are usually 15.6 or larger. And sometimes you have to, you think of it like this, if you have a big house, you need a big roof. So it all depends on what I'm dealing with. Okay. And, and, and on the, um, my regular scleral lens designs, forget about the eye print, but on the regular scleral lens designs, I always fit lenses with reverse geometry, reverse geometry. And usually the lenses, uh, as far as the secondary curve is concerned, it's, uh, Four diopters, four diopters steeper than the base curve. Okay, so the, my regular standard scleral lens designs are all reverse geometry. That helps me give a lift over the limbus. Uh, it just makes for a better fitting lens. And I don't get and I don't get edge lift off that way. Oh, uh, 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 you don't use at all the trial lenses. Uh, yeah, I, I have trial. Yeah, my diagnostic lenses are all four diopter reverse. Yeah, my trial lenses I really use a lot are Jupiter, Jupiter scleral lenses. I have them in all diameter. Di I have fifteen, six, sixteen, six, up to uh, like eighteen, eighteen, and also twenty millimeter scleral lenses. But they're all reverse geometry. So a little thing I've learned over the years, m my life is easier when I design lenses with reverse geometry design. Okay, uh, but most of the time uh, uh, when you are the, when you are taking the, uh, 
uh, as, as an example, when you're using the iPrint Pro impression, uh, uh, do you have to send back again the lens to be uh, to, to do some other? Uh, well, I take the, 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 I don't send the lens back. What I do is, if I need, let's say I need to have uh, more clearance, I'll just tell the lab I need an extra hundred microns of clearance, or I'm getting some limbo staining, or there is an impression at three o'clock or nine o'clock. I'll take photographs, send the photographs and all the imaging to the lab, call them on the phone, they're looking at my images and photographs while I'm looking at them, and they understand what I need to have done. They make up new lenses. We don't, we don't send the lenses back. Uh, we have from Dr. Wazani a question on the chat, if you could, if we don't, if we don't mind to look at the question. Sure. What is the best diameter on central lens thickness you use in penetrating keratoplasty patients? Second question, how many lenses you change generally to have the final lens? Okay, uh, what's the best diameter? Uh, okay, uh, most of the lenses that I use on, uh, well, most of my transplant uh, patients, uh, I use either the eye print or the, uh, uh, or the, uh, the latitude lens, which is designed from the S map and the prof profiling, those lenses are usually 17, 17, 5 millimeters. I let the lab determine the diameter based on the images, but they usually are 17, 17, 5 millimeter. Uh, once in a while, 18, but that's usually it. As far as central thickness, I don't tell the laboratory about central thickness. I don't, dis I don't measure it and I don't uh, ask them. Maybe I should, but I don't. Um, if this works out well, let them do it. Uh, second question, how many lenses? Gee, sometimes I have to go, um, sometimes it's uh, one or two, rarely one, it's sometimes two or three. When there's complications, whatever, sometimes I may go three, four or five. It all depends on the person. I don't know okay. if I'm answering the question. So it could be, it, everyone's different and unique. Sometimes you get a patient that's really easy and sometimes, uh, Someone you want to pull your hair out. Okay, we have a third question from uh, Dr. Wazali. Do you think that the future of scleral lens fitting will be guided by artificial intelligence? Wow, that's a great question. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, I think uh, that's a possibility where artificial intelligence uh, will tell you uh, based on the parameters of what we're looking at and the. Uh, the corneal thickness and the diameter or whatever, uh, this might be the best type of lens design for that patient. And maybe, I think we're a long way from that, I, you know, but who knows? Great question. Okay, uh, any advices for uh, young creators? Do you think that investing in new technologies such as OCT, SME, uh, SMAP, SMAP and iPrint, uh, I, I think I think uh, profilimetry like the Eaglet, which is available in Europe um, and maybe other parts of the world, are something really you should, you should consider. It'll make your life a lot easier and get a more accurate fit. OCT, I mean, I can't function without OCT to look at the relationship of the, between the lens and the cornea, between the back of the lens and the cornea. I mean, it's so precise. Um, back before I had OCT, I was putting fluorescein in the, uh, in, in, on the lens and, and looking with a narrow slip, uh, slip lamp beam to figure out how much clearance I had, which was to me prehistoric. I mean, it was so old, uh, but sorry, I think- Sorry, sorry, uh, do, do, do you mean that you don't use any more fluorescein uh, and uh, slip lamp? I do fluorescein and to make sure the edges are lamp, but not to determine the fit, no. It's all done with, with OCT. So you think that uh, OCT would be a gold standard for sclerals in Absolutely, the absolutely. There, there are several companies out there. There's a German company that called Heidelberg that's making, a, came out with a new anterior seg OCT called the Anterion, which they haven't really marketed, but that's available maybe in Europe uh, by Heidelberg. And I'm sure Zeiss and other companies are going to be coming out with Interior SEG OCT. Yes, uh, for, for the uh, OCT AS, uh, uh, most of the companies now are, are offering in uh, their OCT with this uh, possibility. It, it's, it, it has become a kind of uh, uh, 
something uh, very very natural. I, I have a Redux OCT which is uh, which has also an uh, uh, entire segment model. So uh, the, the thing is that we have to change every time to put the lens and so on. It's a, it's a bit, a bit uh, tricky. I know that there is a company which has uh, which we don't need to. To, to put the lens, uh, to put the, the, the ocular, uh, me, the can, other side of the can, can I turn this around so they can see? Look, uh, can you see? This is my, uh, we have Abby. Can you point to the, can you see the uh, OCT? Can you point to it? That's my interior seg. Are you, yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah, I know if you can see. That's my interior seg OCT. It's right near my chair. So it sits around seven or eight feet away. So I go from the chair to the OCT and back and forth. So I do it very fast, this is very fast. I can just look, it just takes me, oh, seconds. In, in, in a matter of a few seconds, I can see what I'm dealing with. It saves me a lot of time. So, uh, right, and, uh, of course, then you, you are doing the most time, especially the lenses, most well, of the time. You don't do optometry, uh, general optometry. No, we don't, do we don't do anything with eyeglasses. It's everything we do is, uh, Contact lenses, mainly scleral lenses. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a, a really uh, a new development, I think, uh, with OCT. We can see the clearance, we can see the landing, we can see everything. Yeah. We can also manage to see even the angle. Uh, the, yes, uh, yes. That's, that's and, and I think in the going forward in the future, this uh, aberrometry technology is going to blossom out. You are going to see more laboratories utilizing that information to embed it into the optics of a scleral lens. I don't understand it very well. I know it's, it works and it's available here. And if it's available here, it's going to spread other places in the world. I, I think the aberrometry is becoming a very, very nice uh, and useful tool. Uh, I, I use Abiometer uh, with, uh, I, I'm uh, most of the time using uh, RMS, uh, high RMS, yeah. uh, mean square uh, for high aberration. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, we don't have, uh, we, we still have, uh, after having fixed uh, lenses, we still have some uh, higher order aberration. Uh, nevertheless, we are giving maybe bet better uh, image to much better image uh, for Kelcom's uh, people and Kelcom's uh, people mm -hmm. uh, uh, than 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 uh, than with, 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 lens, with the specs or with the soft lenses. That that's happened. Yeah, I I think the world is changing so fast that in, in two or three years from now, what we're talking about right now may seem like ancient history. But I think the the changes are taking place uh, faster, and better things are going to come along in the, in the next year or two years. Uh, we we have a question. We have a question from uh, it's in French. Uh, I'm sorry, but I will try to to, to translate it. Sure. Uh, sure. Do you use other uh, other in, in index uh, quantitative quantitative index to minimize the higher order aberration or, or, or just uh, the MTF? Do I use uh, other uh, or, or, or other value other value uh, the, 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 which uh, your aberrant is giving to you, uh, such as uh, RMS? Uh, no, no, uh, I only use this one. Uh, I only use the one technology from Ovitz, uh, O-V-I-T-Z, Ovitz. I don't use anyone else. I use that, and they have a relationship with a few different laboratories they work closely with. So but that's the only thing. I don't use any other aberrometry. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna measure high order aberrations, I have to have a way of taking care of the problem. And the laboratories uh, work with the Ovitz to design the lens. So I take the images with the aberrometer. That image is, that is uploaded to a laboratory associated with the University of Rochester. They do something with that information, send it to the lab in, in uh, iframe, for example, and they take that information and embed it into the optics of a lens. I, I, that's what I do. I, I, there's nothing else I, 
No other technologies other than that that I work with. I don't know if I answered his question. I, I, yeah, yes. I, I think that uh, you are using Ovid's technology. I, I, uh, you are using uh, Ovid's uh, barometer also. Yes, yeah. It's, it's a kind of uh, technology which is uh, uh, which, which, which can, can give you the ability to or order uh, your lenses with the treatment of the aberration of the higher yeah. order aberrations. Yeah, maybe uh, some of the some of these things that we're using are not available right now, but they will be. You know, it, technology information spreads all over the world, so you, it's, you're not going to find an isolated area where technology exists. It doesn't go anywhere else. It, it's it's going to it's like viral and it'll move around. For, for ocular surface com complications uh, such as ocular surface disease, I, I and so on, uh, uh, how much clearance do, 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 do you do advise people to do uh, with a uh, seven, four, seven uh, point? I would try to, be, after the lens settles down, that's as important because sometimes these lenses can drop 100 microns. So after the lens settles down, I would want at least 200 microns of clearance, at least. Okay. However, let's say you know, you're dealing with irregular cornea, so maybe you have 300 microns looking at the eye, let's say at three o'clock, and then toward nine o'clock you have 50 microns of clearance, you have to increase the clearance. Okay. Or design a lens that's it's appropriate for um, a very distorted cornea. For, for the for the people who have had the uh, uh, herpes zoster herpes or uh, adeno virus herpes uh, uh, conjunctival uh, and they, they have irregular surface, uh, some people are thinking that uh, putting uh, contact lenses, even sclerosis, will put in danger, in at risk uh, the cornea. What do you think I, about this? I don't think so. I, I, if the lens, because if the lenses fit well. And you follow the patient along, you know everything has a risk, of, but the you have to take into consideration the risk-benefit ratio. And when it comes to these compromised corneas, the risk-benefit ratio is definitely going to be in favor of the patient. So it's, as long as the patient is being watched, monitored, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about. Some people uh, from the ophthalmologist side, uh, I have some cases. Or they advise their patients to to well. These yeah, these these guys don't understand scleral lenses and the uh, the impact it can have on a compromised cornea. And if you don't understand something, the natural tendency is to throw a rock at it. Okay. 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 I I, I don't think that there are a lot of questions uh, at the moment. Uh, we have your uh, we have your email. I think uh, most of our members are following your posts, uh, uh, who are becoming very popular in our page and other places such as SLP and so on. So uh, uh, I think that that uh, I started with extreme cases need extreme technologies. I think that each case. Need uh, to be uh, monitored, not to, to be uh, to, to be uh, taken yeah. with very uh, with uh, with w w with wise and uh, very good care. And so, uh, also uh, we have to invest in the new technologies, which uh, can give us the possibility to fit pe pe people with the, the right lenses. Uh, Thank if, you. If, if if the members of, of who are watching this can travel to America next January, you have a major scleral lens meeting. It takes place around the end of January in Las Vegas. Uh, people from all over the world come to that thing. So I think uh, if I can give you that information if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll message it to you if anyone's interested in going. But it's every January. It's really an unbelievable meeting. People from all over who are interested in scleral lens technology. And scleral lens technology is really growing in leaps and bounds. Fastest growing, the most interesting technology Everyone wants to get involved with scleral lenses, and the change, how it can change someone's life is unbelievable. It can, it can take someone who's severely depressed and thinking of suicide and making them a functional human being once again. One of the most impressive, I think, case was the woman which was a victim of, uh, in the Vietnam War. 
and uh, which was fitted by you. And uh, last year, I have seen a picture of you and uh, this lady from Vietnam. I think, right. Uh, yeah. You, you, yeah. Her, her, her name is Kim. Her name is oh, Kim. Yeah. yeah. It's the most famous photograph of the war in Vietnam. Yes. Yes. That's uh, that. that yeah. Uh, that was. Thank you, indeed. Thank you, indeed, uh, Dr. Bushnik. Uh, I hope that uh, that was uh, not the last time we we had to talk to you. <laughs> I'll be happy to. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It was a real uh, treat for me to uh, to do my uh, to explain what I do. Um, but thank you very much. Okay, and I appreciate it. And I I'll send you information on the meeting in Vegas next January. Thank you, indeed. Thank okay. You indeed. Take care. Take care. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.